Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, welcome to this Q&A, um, part of a series to accompany the Creative Essentials book, uh, The Art of Screen Adaptation, Top Writers Reveal Their Craft. Um, I'm Alistair Owen, I'm the author of the book, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by another of those writers, uh, screenwriter and playwright Lucinda Coxon. Lucinda, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, in the book, we focused on Lucinda's TV adaptation of Michelle Faber's The Crimson Petal and the White and her film adaptation of David Eversoff's The Danish Girl. Uh, today, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask her a few new questions, um, including talking about her film adaptation of Sarah Waters' novel The Little Stranger, uh, which was released after I finished the book. Uh, we're going to chat for about 30 minutes, then we'll open it up to questions uh, about any of Lucinda's screenwriting work. Um, uh, which, as Nadine says, uh, you can ask via the chat function. Um, I'll be monitoring those during the interview as well as consulting my notes here. So if I'm looking down or off to the side at any point, that's uh, not because I've lost interest in what Lucinda is saying. Um, so Lucinda, a question I asked all the writers in the book was whether they always agreed a direction of travel with whoever had commissioned the adaptation. And you said it's almost harder to be certain about the shared vision with adaptations than with original material. Why do you think that is? And have you ever found yourself on a different page to the producers of the project? I think, I think with original material, there is an understanding that there's an understanding that there will inevitably be lots of surprises down the road. You don't hire a writer to produce something original in the hope that they'll give you something you've already seen. Um, the problem with adaptation is that everybody's read the source material and people fall in love with the source material and they have a very particular vision of it. Um, and sometimes that isn't, there is just an assumption that um, everybody's dreaming the same dream. Uh, and that's and that's a sort of dangerous assumption. Uh, but it's quite it's quite interesting how often you have to just really ask people to articulate things in a very at a very kind of granular level to, to get a sense of um, what they've got in mind and and just manage their expectations, I guess, of what you're, you know, where, where you're going with it. Uh, I mean, never mind the surprises that unfold in one's own process organically. I mean, sometimes people just have a really different take uh, on a book so or on or on a story or on, on whatever researchers everyone reads a novel in their own way they see the characters in their own way they see the story and the themes in their own way how do you i mean how do you know that you're even vaguely on the same page when you start uh, how do you agree a common frame of reference well i think it it does just have to be a sort of endless conversation um you know, there's a great Chinese description of a marriage as one bed, two dreams. Um, and uh, and that's, it, it, so you have to work at the marriage. <laughs> I guess you just have to work at communicating. And also, I guess you have to assume that if people, you know, people don't hire me if they want a Jack Thorne project. You don't, you don't come to a writer because you want to, you know, unless you kind of know what you're, letting yourself in for and you have to hope that, 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 that there's a kind of marriage of tastes in that respect. And have you ever been in a situation where you know everyone thought they were on the same page and ultimately not and you've gone your separate way? I think I've only never with my own producers with commissioners yes on occasion and that's usually been in fairness that's usually been where for the, project, the project I'm thinking of was at the BBC in a particularly turbulent period for the drama department. And I think the problem there was that the, the, the goalposts were being shifted for them all the time. And so you find yourself, you, you go from being a person who's writing a project for, for, for any of the channels at a time when there were really quite a lot of them, to being a person who really has to be writing something for BBC One. And that's a very different uh project to be involved with and so i kind of think the only time that's really happened to me with commissioners it's been that that's really been the problem i've certainly had i've had weird issues around either gender or culture where um you know i've discovered that what what is funny in to a french producer is really not funny to a british audience 
Um, so I worked for a while on a on a film on a, a, a benighted romantic comedy that in the end was never released because of it was never it was never actually produced because of legal problems that were really elaborate uh, that I had no understanding of before I got involved. But um, it was a a film about a woman who falls in love with her daughter's husband. So it was a a kind of you know older older woman falling in love with a very slightly younger man and the French producers had very different ideas about what would be acceptable in terms of romantic comedy. So I was saying, but we, we can never forgive this mother if she sleeps with him. She has to kind of fall in love with him and then suffer. That's, you know, she has to feel guilty and suffer. That's the only way that works. But of course, it turns out in France, this is simply, this would just not be a problem. And I had lots of conversations about how we couldn't retain sympathy for this woman. And it was fine if we weren't making a romantic comedy, but if we were making you know, something in that very mainstream genre, it just would not work for them to have had a fantastic encounter when she knew that this man was engaged to marry her daughter. So things like that, are things that American producers are very squeamish about, body stuff, they're weirdly squeamish about. Menstruation, they have an absolute horror of um, in America. So there are odd things that you come up against in that sense. But, um, but I think generally speaking, I've found myself largely on the same page with my producers and commissioners. Talking about that that project there reminded me of course that you did a very, which we also didn't talk about in the book, you did a very different kind of adaptation slightly earlier in your career which was uh, an adaptation of a French film I think into a, a, a British um, a British movie with uh, with Emily Blunt and Bill Nye. That's um, right. I mean I don't want to dwell on it particularly, I must confess I've not actually seen it, I keep meaning to watch it. Um, what were the particular challenges of that? Because I've always thought adapting another film must be a very interesting experience. Well, it was that was that was a kind of odd one in that that was a film that uh, the producer Martin Pope and I had both really really liked, um, and we'd both been great fans of the film. And then he met uh, the writer director, um, who's a really wonderful uh, guy called Pierre Salvadori. He he met him at a festival and said, you know, we'd love it, and he. Pierre said, oh, well, I've always wanted to do it in English. I always thought there could be an English language version. And so I, I'm sort of embarrassed to say it was all very, it was all very matey. And we just kind of got on and did it. And we did it with actors we really liked. And yeah, and, it, and we sort of brought Jonathan Lynn out of semi-directing retirement. He, of course, had written Yes Minister. Uh, uh, and then, and yes, Prime Minister here, and he directed My Cousin Vinny. I mean, he's also a great actor, but he just, he'd had a directing career in the States. Um, and he came and directed it. And it was, um, so I, I'm afraid that was, that was actually probably the easiest gig I've ever had in that it was just, it was lots of people I liked. And, um, and yeah, I mean, whether, I don't, I don't know if it worked, but it was really good fun. And the film has just turned up on Netflix actually. And it's got a weird cult following in universities. It seems to be, it's a kind of, it's comfort. And actually it's really been interesting in the pandemic. It's been, it's comfort food. It's some kind of comfort viewing, viewing for people in their early twenties um, who are really um, very hot on it. I think it's, it's incredibly silly. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, and I'm, when yeah. I'm next to a really silly mood, then I'm, I'm going to watch this. Yeah. So it's, it's called Wild Target and it's extremely silly. It's, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to loop back to COVID at the end, actually, in terms of that impact that's had on, on your work as a, as a writer over the past year. Um, when we talked for the book, you explained that you largely write original material for the stage and adapt for film and TV. Is that still the case? Yeah. I mean, I, I did, I've adapted something for the stage this year. Um, I, I did a production, I wrote a, a, an adaptation of a book called Alice Always for the Bridge Theatre in London, which uh, we staged at the beginning of, well, it's a, yes, a couple of years ago now, it's hot time, it's so strange. When we could still be in theatres, we, we made a play. Uh, and that was, that was great. And it's, I mean, I don't know that I want to do lots more of that, but it was a book I, liked that I thought was sort of naughty and fun and Nick Heitner um, who I like enormously uh, came and asked me if I'd do it and again I, you know I think you reach a point in your career also where you you just think please let me work with people I like 
um, apart from anything else. You know, I don't mind, I don't mind a few surprises, but I would just like to have at least one job a year with, with a producer or a director who I know I really am going to have a great time with. And so again, you know, it was a really happy experience and it was a, quite a big love because I don't really do that stuff for the stage. It was, so it was, I, I felt as though I learned quite a lot. Um, and if you're working with somebody like Nicholas Heitner, he runs his own theatre, so you know you've got all the resources of the theatre at your disposal, you know you've got kind of, you know, you're going to have Rolls-Royce actors and Rolls-Royce tech and design, and so it's, a, it's kind of a treat. It's, it's a real treat. Um, and why not write original material for, for film and TV? Is it simply that the chances of it getting made are always that much more dicey? No, it's worse than that. <laughs> It's much worse than that. <laughs> it's what happens if it does get made. Um, it's, I think it's some, I mean, I think I wouldn't feel that way if I were a director, if I write a director, but I'm, I think I'm not. I mean, I, I've had days where I thought I sh should be a director because I was so cross the director I was working with just in an ordinary, you know, impatient, frustrated way that we all, kind of have um but um the, the main reason is that very early in my career I wrote a film called Lily and the Secret Planting um which was very kind of personal and precious because I was young and at an age where things are personal and precious um and it was entirely original and it went into production with Winona Ryder and Gail Garcia Bernal lovely Paul Basachaji, sadly no longer with us, Linda Bassett, and Winona got ill um, about three weeks into production and the production shut down. We waited for her to get recover and then we tried to shoot everything without her. And in the end, it was, and it possibly remains, um, the biggest insurance uh, case in British film history. I don't know if it's been superseded, but so that project, that script is now owned by Chubb, and I can do nothing about that. So it's so it's gone. And uh, so to lose control of a piece of material like that is actually, I found that really hard. And that doesn't happen in the theatre. So I just thought I don't want to do that again. I don't want to take that kind of chance again. Um, the Crimson Petal and the White, um, both as a novel and a TV series, was one of the most interesting things I read and watched uh, as research for the book. And although the adaptation was critically acclaimed, it didn't quite seem to make the popular impression it should have. Do you think audiences at the time were used to seeing cosier period adaptations and that it would make more of an impact if it aired now? Yeah, I think the, I think the, um, the streamers have really shifted the dial on what people will accept in terms of period TV, but an enormous uh, amount of the stuff that I see is very heavily influenced by Crimson Petal. I mean, I can see the design influences. I can see the sound design has been carried over. It was, I think it had a really big impact professionally. Um, and it's, so I, but it was hilarious when it first came out that people were complaining to the BBC that they couldn't hear what they couldn't hear what characters were saying because the wind was rustling in the trees and all that sort of thing. There were lots of those sorts of complaints. Um, but, but I think also quite found it a hard watch. Um, people found it a hard watch. Which is appropriate. I mean, it's uncomfortable. Uh, I think they, did, they found it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, um, and they, they, I think they were sort of shocked to see Gillian Anderson playing um, a woman who was prostituting her own daughter. I mean, I think they, that, you know, even if, it, even if it was in the past, they were just sort of, I think people found that quite hard work. And to see Chris O'Dowd not being that guy, you know, not being that funny guy, uh, they, were, they were just a bit sort of confronted by that maybe. But um, I mean, it was, it was, you know, it did very well and everyone was very happy with it. And as you say, it was kind of, I'm, Again, I, that was really, I was really lucky with that because I had not been, I'm, I wasn't a great fan of adapting for TV or writing for TV at all. And that was, that couldn't have been a better experience. Mark Monden's an amazing director and the design team on that show, were, were, they were just phenomenal um, with not that much of a budget. Um, 
and they were all super super committed i couldn't have really asked for more alistair i can't hear you I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> uh, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep, no, you're back. Apologies, everyone. We had a few glitches before we um, came on this evening. So if that happens again, apologies. Nadine's on it and we'll be back with you shortly. Um, uh, where was I? Yes. Are you, are you happier now to write for TV, adapt for TV as well as for film? Well, I don't think there's in a way I don't think there's much choice uh, anymore um, and the and the pandemic definitely accelerated that um, I'm like anyone who is you know lucky enough to be offered jobs I follow the material it's really about the material and so in the at the moment I'm just at the beginning of working on a um, a TV gig and that's but that's entirely about the material and the producers really it was just when I looked at the jobs on the table it was just the most exciting um, and challenging thing that I'd been offered and so that's where I that's where I've gone with it I think um, I my, my issue with TV is simply it's sort of it's not I don't think it's laziness but I really am a kind of like 120 minute person I don't really like the idea of uh, being, I don't, I don't want to be writing something for the next 10 years. I don't really want to write 10 episodes of anything. When there are some people who love that long form thing and they go, but imagine you could track that relationship over decades. And I just think, God, shoot me, you know, cause I just, I'm really much more of a kind of intense short shot shot. I like all the emotion in the box, crank it up. Um, so that's really, you know, my background is in theater and I think that's, what I like. I had a conversation a few years ago about with when when they were trying to m make a TV version of The Handmaid's Tale and they called me about it and I had been incorrectly briefed by my then uh, American agent and so I thought God Handmaid's Tale love that book love that book was very excited and I and I thought it was a sort of prestige mini series or whatever they call these things and um and so I got onto the call and said so I, I'm I'm so I'm slightly confused how many how many episodes are you thinking because I thought this sounds like more than three episodes and they said well it would be you know 10 episodes per series and a five series arc and I honestly just laughed I just thought 50 fucking episodes are you kidding me I mean I'm not gonna live that long I can't I'm not gonna live long enough so I thought when, when am I going to walk the dog? I thought, no, it's out of the question. I just, and they were, and, the, and it was, I thought I, they were saying, oh, but Margaret Atwood would come and you could work there. And I was, and I thought, I can't believe that I, I'm going to say no to this. But I mean, I, I wasn't just that I was saying no, I was really just kind of running in the opposite direction. I just could no more do that than fly to the moon. I can't think of anything more terrible. I mean, that's a job. That's a job of work. And I don't, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I wanted a job, you know. Thank you. I think that's one of the best answers I've ever had in one of these Q&As. Um, so uh, a, more, a more technical screenwriter question now. Um, Crimson Petal, like The Little Stranger, makes use of uh, voiceover. Um, and of the dozen interviewees in the book, you were one of the few who really embraced that device, uh, which really surprised me because I love voiceover. Um, the lead characters of Sugar and Dr. Faraday could both be called unreliable narrators, couldn't they? But in very different ways. How would you delineate the differences between those? Because in the, the Michel Faber novel is has a sort of omniscient narrator, and you trans transform um, some of that into into narration for yeah. Sugar. Whereas Sarah Waters' novel actually is written in the first person, at least. Yeah, it's 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 very different, um, and I think probably one of those is one of those is more successful than than the other. Uh, I think I I really like voiceover. I don't or I don't have I mean there's a terrible snobbery about voiceover but I like a film with voiceover I like being told a story um and and I like 
I think if you've got an unreliable narrator, then voiceover is an absolute gift. Um, with sugar and the crimson petal and the white, that was it was that was very much about her writing her own story, um, and and about her being in control of the information um, that we were getting and also I just really needed to give her a voice she's a very isolated character who doesn't have anyone else to talk to actually at a practical level you know she needs to speak and the book is the book is one of the ways she does that and when we get to the end of Crimson Petal which was I think it was a bit controversial at the time because it remained quite open-ended you didn't you never really found out what happened and uh she just writes in her book and you don't get to, you don't get to see what she's you don't get to see what she's writing and I kind of felt as though by then we'd seen that woman you know from every possible angle we'd, we knew that woman we, we'd she'd been exposed to us uh in so many ways and what she'd earned by then was the right to privacy and we were not going to be reading over her shoulder and she got to close the book on us uh and I, that was that was a very kind of conscious part of you know if you're writing something for the screen about a Victorian prostitute, you have to work very, very hard to protect that character and that, and indeed that actor. Um, and that was really very bound up with that. Um, in The Little Stranger, again, I, you know, I, I had enormous sympathy for Faraday. Uh, and I felt that, I always felt that we should have the voiceover. But what I would say is that voiceovers can be hostage to fortune for a writer because, voiceovers obviously can be tinkered with endlessly in an edit uh, and I think he, I sometimes think that the, there was we wrote extra voiceover for the little stranger during the edit and I'm not sure I think it's perhaps I think there's maybe a bit too much of it if I'm honest I think there's a bit too much so I think there was there was certainly less of it to begin with and I think um I think it's an easy thing to play with in an edit uh, and y y you it's quite hard to hold the line at that point as the writer it's quite I found it very easy to hold the line before production but once once people are going oh it'd be just great if instead of what we had there could we just tweak it so we have a thing like this so you when you're offering up versions you're offering possibilities to people um which I think was definitely happening in the edit on that just out of sort of playfulness a lot of the time just because they could um I, I sometimes think we there's just a bit too much of it and sometimes it feels a little bit I just think yeah I would have pulled back on that actually I would never have you know written that would not have been in the shooting script it's actually it's, a, so that's what I would say is because it's a particularly complicated novel to adapt from this point of view because yeah. it is an unreliable narrator um no I'm, I'm treading carefully here because there may be people that haven't read it and haven't seen it and I don't particularly want to spoil the twist um but I, I flicked back through the book today to remind myself how it ended and the Faraday character I'd forgotten that the Faraday character ultimately knows less or has admitted less to himself than the yeah. reader knows. yeah now that is phenomenally hard to do on screen like no, you must have struggled with that somewhere Nightmare. It's it's a nightmare to it's it's it, it well it's it's I mean I think I hadn't understood how hard it would be until I sat down and started and thought and suddenly thought oh shit what am I what have I let myself in for that you're it goes against you, you have to kind of relearn to write because it goes against all your instincts and that this is a character who does not a quad, who has no self-knowledge and does not reflect and cannot reflect on on himself on, and on his kind of motivations and it's very very odd to write a character who does not come to a realization of anything he, he just never gets there that's you know that's a very peculiar journey to go on uh, it, it's very odd yeah. In conventional screenwriting terms, and I don't think I've even really quite worked this out, even having seen it several times and, uh, until you just said it, he, he doesn't have what you might call a character arc. He doesn't learn, he doesn't move on, he doesn't yeah. realise. Yeah. Interesting. No, although he affects, he affects all this change. 
Mm. And he gets and he gets a version of what he wanted all along. But it's but it just turns out to be nothing. It turns out to be it just continues to escape him. Sarah Waters didn't start writing The Little Stranger as a ghost story, but went back and rewrote it when she realised it could be one, which is one reason why it's as much psychological as it is supernatural. Were the generic conventions of the ghost story a help or a hindrance to you in adapting the novel? Well, they were, they were a big complication because, but, but not least because we only, the supernatural occurrences are things that we only hear about in the novel from Faraday. So we have no way of knowing <laughs> whether any of them are true. Um, and obviously it's, a, it's one thing to hear something described or relate, narrated in retrospect. Um, it's another thing to see it. It's another thing to, to see objects move around or a, a library burst into flames and so on. Um, and I think we, my feeling was always that it was a, it was a psychological piece. And, that, but I think Sarah's, Sarah had a different take on it. I mean, when I spoke to Sarah about it, I remember I was, I was kind of surprised that I said, I talked about it really from this, from a kind of psychological point of view. Um, and she said, yeah, plus there's a poltergeist. And I said, but there isn't really a poltergeist because the poltergeist is, you know, this, this kind of emotion that's in the house. Um, and she said, yeah, yeah, exactly, but it's a poltergeist. Um, and I fought very shy of the poltergeist for a long time, but um, uh, yeah, but people have very different ways of describing that stuff. Um, and I'd also, actually, I, I, one of the most great admirers, I'm thrilled to say, is, um, is Guillermo del Toro, and I've now had lots of conversations with him about, you know, I mean, Guillermo also knows a thing or two about ghosts he's completely obviously fully paid up um uh fully invested in in the supernatural category and i yeah and it's fine we can have those conversations but i just do come at them as, from a different angle um, yeah it's interesting that you mentioned him because i was going to ask a separate question about that because um <clears throat> three years or so before um little strangers i think you've done a, a rewrite on crimson peak um, it's not something I asked you about for the book because it wasn't an adaptation, clearly. But I mean, um, I'd love to know a little bit more about that. And and did did working on that very kind of full fledged Grand Guignol um, horror film have did your thinking for that impact the way you then approach the much more subtle, um, ambiguous Little Stranger? I've got a feeling they weren't, it wasn't quite in that order. I think Little Stranger took a while, you know, went, went through quite a few. I think we, what happened with Little Stranger is that I, I wrote Little Stranger and then I went to Crimson Peak and then I came back to Little Stranger so that, that's how that worked. And Crimson Peak in fact came out of the Crimson Petal and the White because Guillermo had seen Crimson Petal and the White. Um, and Again, I've never done, I've never, it's the first time I've ever done a rewrite on anyone else's project. I've never had any interest in doing rewrites on other people's projects. But if Guillermo asks you, you what, who's going to say no? Are you really going to say, no, I don't want to see what that process is like? I just, I, I just, no, I don't want to go meet him. I don't, that's not, doesn't seem, that doesn't seem like fun to hang out with him. So I, anyway, I, so I went, it was, and, it, and you know, he's phenomenal. And, and I, yeah, he's he's very very kind, clever, brilliant creature, um, and you learn a lot from being around him just about operating uh, in the world, in the film world. But um, I think, I mean, I'd be honest. I think, I think I was partly hired to, to sort of help to organise. It was partly, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I was partly there to. to possibly to tone tone Crimson Peak down a bit and organize it and get it into a slightly more manageable shape and I think I, I thought I did a really great job of you know making it all a bit more nuanced and all the rest of it and then I think he took it away and kind of doubled everything and added 10 and we would have we would have these conversations where I'd say I think you know nine dead wives is too many because this character is only if he's going to be played by Tom Hiddleston I mean that's like Tom Hiddleston isn't that old. 
So how, how often is he managing to get married and then kill off a wife? I mean, 10 is a lot. And he'd say, okay, seven. And I said, what about three? Three's a good number. He's like, it's nowhere near enough dead wives. And I said, but there are a lot, there's a lot going on and we have to keep track of all the dead wives and they all have a backstory. He's going, yes, yeah, seven is a good number. And so there was, it was like really that kind of horse trading over about how many ghosts there were. And yeah, and I, you know, so it's not normally like me to be the person saying, no, I think you just can't, you can't have that, it's too much. But, but that, that felt like the job. And um, it was enormously good fun. And he was, he's a very, you know, generous individual. But I, th and I think in the end, yeah, there was lots of the work that I'd done as in the film, but he just added in as many extras as, you know, well, he just was bonging things in like crazy as he went along. I mean, he writes as he directs, he rewrites in the scene as he's working. And he's, a, he's, you know, what can I say? That was always, I never felt as though, that, you know, I was making a huge contribution to this project. It's his voice is so distinctive um, that you're, it's very clear that you're, that I was kind of there for the ride really. And it was really good fun. It sounds like a fun ride. Sounds it's a fun ride to hear about, never mind to uh, be part of. Um, the Little Stranger shares the unsettling atmosphere of the novel. How do you translate something intangible like atmosphere or tone from the pages of a novel to the pages of a script? Well, that's really, I mean, the short answer is I have no idea. Um, I mean, it's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard with that. with that project that was there was a lot that was hard about it but in a sense what was unsettling about it was really in the emotional life or the lack of emotional life of those characters um I suppose and the house you know the house is its own is, is a character in its own right as we must all say when we are involved with films like this it's the it's a it's a cliche but it's kind of true um and I certainly remember reading, when I read Sarah's book, when I read the book the first time, I, I did find it really, I don't know if I found it frightening, but I found it really creepy and unsettling. There was something very, um, there was something kind of just really constantly, quietly disturbing about it. And you realize that it is, it is this insinuating man. It's this man who is constantly trying to telling you how hard he's working and how much he's trying to help everybody and yet everything seems to be going wrong all the time and it is that I mean it is it's a kind of feminist classic in its way is it's the man who's come to help you and is going to save everybody of course turns out to be in many ways the, the root cause of lots of the problems um, but I think you can only do it by trying to channel into what's really true and present and um you know, honest about it and I it's I was particularly attracted to Little Stranger because when I read it it actually reminded me of my dad my because and my father's mother um worked in service she was Welsh and she came from Wales to England to work in service when she was 13 years old and so my father was brought up with this crazy kind of mismatch in terms of the class that he was born into, but the kind of manners that his mother wanted him to have. So he was calm, he wasn't really allowed to play with the rough boys in the street because she wanted him to just be a bit grander. And she wasn't, I mean, she was not a maid in a very grand house. She was a maid in a sort of middle-class house, but she, you know, he, he, he really felt that class element in his life he really really felt it he really felt sort of in he, he was ended up being actually perfectly successful but he could never quite get that monkey off his back that he always felt judged and he never felt quite good enough um and I remember the first time he went to America he said it's so fantastic because you go there and they they say oh you're English you sound so you sound so posh uh which, you know, and he, he, he spent his, all his life, he was born in Derbyshire, he grew up in Derbyshire, and, you know, he never went anywhere where anyone thought he sounded posh, I promise you. When he came to London, he, sat, he thought he sounded like a terrible kind of hick. And so he really felt that. And, I, and he, and it was a kind of blight in his life in, in lots of ways. It's why I'm called Lucinda, 
no one else in my family you know I come from a family where everybody's called Sydney and Mavis and Sheila and Audrey and you know and then I'm called Lucinda and my sister's called Felicity I mean it's just it was there's just a crazy kind of social kind of aspiration on, on my father's part and um and it comes out of that and so I think I Farad so the answer in a sense the question is I really felt Faraday's pain it, I mean for all that he is a toxic male and a sort of psychopath <laughs> I I just I just knew what it was to have that that thing of having your nose your face at the sweet shop window but being the boy he wasn't allowed in I just knew what that I knew what that cost that that so I think that probably ties into something you said when we when we talked for the book, which is that you only pick adaptations where you feel that the material needs you and you need it, and that feels like an answer to that question almost. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Just because it, because it's a long road, you know, uh, a project can be, and I mean sometimes things are easy, but sometimes things take, you know, things take a decade, and so unless you really care. Um, it would be great if everybody's projects were kind of done and dusted in a couple of years, but it doesn't always work like that. And so I think unless you're really committed, you just don't, you, you just wouldn't last. So yeah, for me, that's, that's the deal. I'm going to open it up now to some of the questions that are, have been coming in on the side um, bar here. Uh -huh. um, so bear with me a sec while I just kind of um, uh, digest those. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, from Poppy Burton Morgan. Um, in terms of cultural and gender expectations, do you think the rise of Netflix and the notion of global audiences from streaming services will change those differences slash norms? Wow, I, well, I guess there will be some of that. Actually, I'm just, the, the, the series that I'm working on at the moment is set in India and it will be so obviously it, it'll have a big audience, I would hope, in India. I've just um, brought in an Indian writer to work with me uh, on it and who's, who's fantastic. Uh, and I'm very grateful to have him, a guy called Sudeep Sharma, who wrote a brilliant series called Patal Lock, which you can watch on Amazon if you are a person who can bear to have Amazon. Um, and but I do with that, I kind of think, okay, but this is, there's so much stuff here that will be incredibly, there's a lot of background information that would be completely redundant for an Indian audience. But on the other hand, nobody in Britain knows this. So in America, I mean, who am I? So that is a bit of a, I'm still playing with who am I, who is this for? Who am I, who am I really making this for? Um, but in terms of, I don't know, cultural norm, I think, I don't know. I mean, I sort of, I hope it, I mean I don't think it will get blanded out I think I think um I think Americans will probably continue to be squeamish about um I mean so actually Crimson Petal the big problem with Crimson Petal uh with America the, was was the abortion it was just the, the arguments about that and the distress about that um were, were remarkable so they didn't really care about the poverty and they didn't care about the sex and they didn't care about the violence but the idea that a woman would um, would have an abortion, uh, and that you, that you would see that sort of that that child that that awful kind of moment in Sugar's life, um, they were people were really horrified by that. And actually, there was a bit of a pushback here about that. So it's it's so I don't think those things are going to change hugely. I mean, I think the stuff that's the big mainstream global product is is what it is now and I think there will still be lots of niche markets I see there'll still be lots of niche markets and so for the French French mother-in-laws will continue to be able to have sex with their daughters husbands without anybody being too obsessed about it in France hurrah thank you um <laughs> so uh, sorry, you're struggling to ask questions and not laugh. Um, so the last one of these we did was with the lovely David Nichols. Um, now, of course, he adapts his own work from one medium to another. A uh, question from, oh, it's from Olivia. Olivia Hetry. Hello, Olivia. Another one of my interviewees, former Guild president. Um, Hello, Olivia. 
do you or would you adapt your own plays to film or TV? That's an interesting one, which I didn't ask in the book. Yeah, it's I I I haven't, and I don't much like the idea of it. I, I mean, I've been asked in the past for things. I don't. I, don't, I, I, I think stage and screen are two really different animals and I would like to think that I don't write things for the theatre that could be done on screen because why would I be writing them for the theatre? Um, so I, I mean, I guess I, um, yeah, I, I don't, it, yeah, I, I, I quite like to keep them apart. I think I've, 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 I have a little play I wrote for the National Theatre that was a sort of shortish play was, um, was that was made into a kind of little film but I mean it's a sort of 15 minute film and that was really good fun it was a really interesting exercise but I don't really I think they're discrete forms I just really don't want to work I don't want to write I suppose I don't want to write screen for the stage that's the risk is you become one of those people generally plays that I don't know is that true actually there are lots of really good films of Rattigan but that's a particular kind of play there are not so many stage plays that really move across I mean nobody wants to see Carol Churchill the movie you know I, I just think it's not I can't imagine it and it's not the kind of theatre I really enjoy I don't think nobody wants to watch Gregory Motten 2 uh the sequel on you know with, with Bruce Willis I just think it's not the same beast um now this is an interesting one it's quite a it's quite a big question actually um from uh Adeem McCarthy um could you please talk about the various steps of your process when adapting material for TV and film? Where do you start? How do you develop character arcs when perhaps they may not be there on the page? That's quite a lot to try and summarise. The short answer to that for me would be, of course, there's an excellent book on the subject called The Art of Screen Adaptation. But um, Lucinda, see if you can uh, summarise that. In where well, do you start? I guess you start with that. Where do you start? You've got the book in front of you. What's your what's your actual first step other than reading the thing? I will have once I've read. I mean, in a sense, you. I think probably this is how you know you're going to take on a project is that you, when you read something on spec, you you start the work as soon as you start reading. I think that's the thing is you realise you're halfway. That's Certainly when I read Crimson Petal the second time, I, I'd read it at quite a long, I'd read it maybe 10 years earlier and I came back to it and I realised about halfway through that I'd already, I'd already done a lot of the work. I, it had already, I'd already begun. Um, and so that process, that sort of filleting process happens quite quickly sometimes on a good day. I mean, that's a, that's a particularly good day. Um, yeah, that thing of holding the voice in your head, holding, hold it, finding out tonally what it's going to be, um, figuring out where the dropped stitches are, what isn't isn't going to translate. Um, I think it's very instinctive. It's a really, I mean, that's a really annoying answer, but I do think it's very kind of instinctive. It's it's like um, it's it's a sort of musical instinct in a sense. It's like how how are we going to carry this tune? all the way through these hundred minutes or however many minutes and what what level of naturalism are we operating in what all those kinds of questions I think are um are kind of huge and if you don't break those quite early on um you're in you're in a lot of trouble later uh, but but you know character that, that that sort of thing I mean that's the job that's if you you know if if that isn't instinctive for you then it, it, you may be doing the wrong thing I can't hear you again, I'm afraid. There we go. Back. Thank you. Never had any problems before. Don't know what's going on tonight. Um, that's a very technical one. Someone asking here about adapting a short story. Uh, that's again, not something we covered at any point in the book. It's a very particular... Have you ever done that? And if you haven't, how would you... It's often said that a short story or a novella is actually the, probably the best kind of adaptation of source material for a feature film because you're you're not having to cut, you're only having to expand. Have you ever been in that position? 
I've not. I've only had to cut massively, massively uh, on the whole. And I don't know that that. I mean, there are there are certainly you know versions of great novellas. Um, I don't. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, I suppose I haven't been offered a short story or a novella that I was particularly attracted to. I have every now and then, you know, wondered about things. Of course, you know, when you, it's quite hard to, to read for pleasure. Now I'm sure everybody, uh, everybody struggles a bit with, or it's hard to know it, whether you're reading for pleasure uh, or whether you're, you know, to turn off that sort of analytical bit. Um, I suppose, so I do quite often think, oh, would this adapt? Is this something I would want? To, is this something I want to work with? But um, yeah, it's never, it's, it just hasn't come up for me, the short story thing actually. So I, I can shed no light on that. I'm struggling off the top of my head to think of an adaptation, of a film adaptation of a short story. I can think of several great film adaptations of novellas. Um, yes. The yeah. Sense of an Ending, um, The Comfort of Strangers, uh, um, On Chesil Beach. Two of those are McC uh, McEwen, of course, who tends to write novellas rather than long novels. These yeah, days. Oh, excellent. Yes. Oh, great. This is where this is where the chat function is brilliant. Is people are now suggesting. Not, I've, I've, been, I've not been looking at the chats. I'm so I thought I'd just be confused. Um, just don't look now. Of course, what from Maurier. Uh, Lantana uh, is based on a Raymond Carver story. It's the same story, actually, that Shortcuts was uh, one of the bits of Shortcuts was based on. Brokeback Mountain. Shawshank Redemption is a long short story. These are excellent. Thank you very much, guys. You know much. I thought more. Lantana was based on uh, Andrew Burwell's play, but anyway, that's sorry, not Lantana. I think um, I think Jindabine is probably the, the movie that they're thinking of there. There you go. Okay. Jindabine. Yes. Good. Excellent. Oh, Arrival too. Um, fantastic. Thank you all for those. Um, I'd like to loop back um, with a couple of questions of my own. Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so if anyone else does have uh, any other um, uh, uh, questions, uh, do, do feel free to type them in. Um, have you written any adaptations which you still want to get made? Is, is there anything sort of hanging around there that's, that's like, oh, I really want to get this one away? Oh, I, I, years ago, I, I read an adaptation of, um, of something that I think is sort of, it probably is unmakeable for, because for political reasons, um, but it's, it was a great story, uh, called, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great slim volume called Mother of Pearl, um, and it's, uh, but it's about a woman, it's a, it's, it's set in Belfast and it's about, a Protestant woman who steals a baby from a Catholic mother who didn't really want another child anyway, but it is a baby, it's a child abduction story. And it's about this woman's love for this abducted baby. And it is, I mean, in retrospect, I think, how did we really think this was ever going to be made and that people would thank us for this? But, uh, you know, but, but it is a fantastic story and it's a great human story, but I can see that politically it's, Bit <laughs> completely you can see why financiers are just like huh seriously but yeah so that but I've accepted that that will never be um I didn't the book the book that I was offered that I loved and that I would have loved to have adapted but I could only have I couldn't see how to do it without completely destroying it is a uh, a novel called the Vintner's Luck which was eventually uh, done by Nikki Caro and I think not terribly successfully which just made me think yes I, it's not I think it's unadaptable but it's a but if anyone please somebody have a go at doing a good job on that because I couldn't figure out how to do it I think it's a really it would be a great we sh there should be some residential kind of weekend where ten writers go away and try to break the back of uh, the Vintners Lock by Elizabeth Knox because it's a great book but I yeah, again. Um, someone here, uh, Carolyn Mil Milner, sorry, has asked um, uh, what you feel are the pros and cons of a novelist adapting their own work. That feels very much like a question for David Nichols, really. Um, and David Nichols does talk about that, um, as does uh, Deborah Mogach uh, in the book. Um, do you have anything to say on that or am I redirecting to the book in that instance? No, I think it's, uh, well, I think, I mean, I, I will always um, ask the novelist if they have any interest in adapting their own work, if I'm because you do, 
I think I do always want to know that the novelist has absolutely zero interest in doing it themselves because you don't want, I think I, I'm less worried about that now than I used to, but um, nobody wants to feel as though there's someone, you know, sort of elbowing in the background, feeling a bit left out. Um, and I have been lucky that the people I've worked with have mostly been very um, glad to hand it off and have, ne have not had ambitions in that um, direction. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know that novelists are the, I mean, sometimes the novelists do a great job with their own work. It's, it's uh, I mean, they're two different skills and some, some people have both. I think it's a simple, I don't think it's a hard and fast rule. Some people are, you know, some people do both. Yeah. Um, this is a slightly more technical one. Have you ever gone after source material where the rights mm -hmm. haven't been bought yet, or have you always sort of been invited on board projects when the, the option has already been taken? Uh, no, I think I went after something once and found that the rights had already gone. Um, but I don't generally chase material. I partly because it's just I, I'm just quite busy, and so rather than I, uh, there's what I find is that there's never time to write an original play. That's what I always would like to be doing next is writing a play, and the plays get squeezed out all the time. So I would be daft to go chasing original uh, to, to go chasing material for myself. Um, or perhaps that's just laziness, but I don't think so. I, I mean, I, yeah, if I've got the kind of energy to go chasing things, it would be, it would be so that I could write a play. Uh, one more question from the side here, then I've got one more question of my own, and then I think we're, I think we're done, which seems to have sped by actually. Um, how do you work on, uh, I think it's called a director's draft, really, it's the shooting script, um, particularly if the director is someone who maybe has a very different style than perhaps what you had in mind when you were writing the script. That's, that's very interesting, actually. The whole relationship between the screenwriter and the director is multifaceted. But that particular question in terms of, you know, you, you're, you're writing, you're close to production, you've got a director on board who has a very particular kind of style. And, and generally speaking, that style is potentially at odds with, with your approach. How, have you ever been in that position? And if so, how would you deal with that? Well, I suppose when I when I was much younger, and I was part of a, a, a theatre company called Loose Exchange, and there was some cra a crazy decision that we would do a show that was com that comprised lots of shorter pieces. It was a sort of group show, so there were five six writers, and we all had a couple of short pieces in the show, and it made a complete evening. Um, and then it was decided that at the beginning of the evening when the audience had arrived, they would put starting points, they would give, be given a slip of paper, they put starting points into a hat. And one of the writers would, every night, one of the writers would write a new short play based on a starting point pulled out of a hat, and it would then be performed at the end of the show. And it, it seemed to me that this was a completely impossible thing to pull off but actually we did it and eventually lots of the writers turned out not to live in London and it ended up me, being me and, and another writer so every other night I had to write a short play based on a starting point put out of a hat and the great thing about that is it it taught me that there is always another rabbit in the hat you as a and as a young you're very I was a very precious young writer of course as is only writing proper but it really taught me that it's not always a very pretty rabbit. Sometimes it's a really fucking weird looking rabbit, but there is always a rabbit in the hat. And so it, it, it kind of just made me a bit less neurotic, I suppose, about the process. And the, the parallel to that is one of the incredibly annoying things about the Danish girl is that it took about 11 years to get it made. But one of the great things about that is that the number of directors who tried to, who wanted to make it in that period, and the quality of the directors was very high. And so I've done new rights for that film where uh, Nicole Kidman was going to be in the Eddie Redmayne part, where, uh, and she was going to be directed by, I don't know, Thomas Alfredson, Lassa, Hallstrom, and Tucker. I mean, the list is, the list goes on and on and on. So I have done drafts for all of those people. I've done drafts for so many different actors. It was going to be Rachel Weiss was in the mix. Charlize Theron was in the mix. Um, all kinds of Johnny Depp was in the mix. It's, I've done it. I've cut that. I've cut that film so many different ways. 
and the challenge is to basically manage to do that well, and have it remain your script, have it remain your film and to just fight to protect it um, because you, you, that's, you're all kind of all it's got um, it, at some level. Uh, and no matter how great and supportive your producers are, you have to be the person who fights for the script. Um, and so I think you work, of course, you work with directors, but directors very often don't some, I mean, this is a terrible generalization. Some directors are absolutely brilliant on script, but some really brilliant directors are really terrible on script and they, you have to show them what won't work. Um, but you, you just have to try and show them what won't work and, and have faith that they will see it won't work. And, you know, you have to kind of fight the corner. And that's, so that script, I fought the corner on that script in so many different directions and from so many angles. Um, and in the end, I think I, you know, I did a pretty good job of protecting it as, as these things go. I did, I certainly did my best and I think I did a pretty good job of protecting it. So I think you just have to, you know, stay true I and mean, be open-minded, but really stay true because you do know it better than anybody else. Um, that's a great way to end the a bit on adaptation. I just have a general question at the end, which I think a lot of writers are probably interested in the answer to and have all been struggling with, which, as I said earlier, is how has COVID, the last year, lockdown, how has it all affected your work as a writer, both in terms of projects being commissioned and made and your ability to simply focus on writing them? Well, I'm less, I've been less socially distanced for this last year than is normal because everybody else is working from home, which is really irritating. And I'd like them all to go back to their offices where they belong um, and leave me in peace. Um, so in terms of what I'm, what hasn't happened this year, I'm not making a film with Sir Anthony Hopkins be because the COVID situation was too dangerous and we were supposed to go in the spring and that just didn't happen. So I, we, I'm hoping we'll be making that later this year if everything's under control. Um, I'm, my, I'm not doing John Gabriel Borkman with Simon Russell Beale at the bridge because that was, <laughs> that was in the middle of the pandemic. I'm not, I've written a version of Raymonda with Tamara Rojo for English National Ballet uh, that we will be doing in about 12 months time rather than now. Um, she and I have also been working on a production of Cinderella for the Royal Ballet Theatre in Stockholm that is that it's been pushed a year. I um, mean, all that sort of car crash of stuff has happened. Um, on the other hand, the writing has just, you know, there's been enough writing. There's been plenty of work to be doing. I have found it, like I'm everyone else, I'm sure, I found it weirdly difficult and I've had that sort of slight brain fog that everybody's had because when I was sitting at the desk working, it was that was all the same, but outside the window, everything was completely different. I think everybody's felt that that slight, uh, yeah, that sort of mixture of boredom and stress that kind of wears you out. And I've missed seeing people. I mean, I got really bored of taking myself for a walk. I've done lots of walking meetings to try and keep myself going with producers and with other writers, but actually I got, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm very excited now to be going into offices and having meetings. I'm going into rehearsal next week with a little play that we're doing at the Soho Theatre with a real audience. You know, it's that's really exciting. It's that we're just doing it for three nights and streaming it. But I'm really excited to be going to sit in a room with actors and a director and my designers. I mean, I'm really so yeah. I mean, I'm I'll be glad to be back with people, even though I'm actually a, you know a person who. I mean, you don't become a writer by accident. I'm quite happy sitting in a room on my own for very long periods of time. But even I've missed people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And um, good luck with all those projects. Um, so I'm afraid our time is up. Um, if you want to hear more from Lucinda, she's one of 12 terrific screenwriters in the art of screen adaptation. Um, this is my little promotional bit, so bear with me. Um, and until the end of April, there's 25% off the book if you order via Creative Essentials. Uh, you'll find links to their website on my Twitter bio at Alistair Writer and on my website uh, alistairandwriter.com. Um, as Nadine will probably explain, the interview will be available on the Writers Guild YouTube channel, uh, along with my previous Q&As with David Nichols, Moira Buffini and Olivia Hetreid. Um, and the previous interviews in the series before we had the bright idea of partnering with the lovely people at the Guild. Um, are also available via my website. I did Q&As with Jeremy Brock and Hossein Amini. 
Um, so finally, as ever, uh, a big thank you to the Guild for hosting this event. Um, a bigger thank you to all of you for watching and for reminding me of all the fantastic films that were based on short stories. Uh, um, and the biggest thank you, of course, to Lucinda for taking the time to talk to us and frankly make us all laugh. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's lovely to see all these faces. Nadine. Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, it was really enjoyable. It was really funny. Um, I think I saw a lot of people laughing, so that's great. Um, so thank you to Lucinda and also, as always, thank you to Alistair. Um, I've put the link for his book in the chat. Um, if you got something out of this and you'll absolutely get something out of out of the um, out of the book. So uh, just to remind you that these events um, and, and all the events that we do um, and, and actually this month alone, we've done 11 events with the Writers Guild. So um, are possible because of our members because people are members of the union and we create that community and then we get to do these things so if you're not a member absolutely please join um, and take a look at our website 